Well, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, Steve Kelly already on the first evening told you how great Rabobank is, so I will just focus on topics and don't bore you with uh, how awesome my company is. Now, I love to be here. I've been in London for uh, seven or eight years with Rabobank and came down last year in January to head up the research team. My heart is with farming and uh, I'm proud to be in a room with farmers and I love to be out on farm as well. And I thought today we set the scene a little bit with what are some of the big things coming from the globe where also Australia should think hard, how can we maybe benefit all the way down to farm with that. So maybe start off very quickly on the trade side. Well, you've already seen it. Uh, Bali is back in the game and that is awesome for us. But let's not think that uh, China will just say, oh, here we go and we give you wine as the next one. They probably do, but we're going to have these tensions in terms of trade over and over and over again. We actually think geopolitics will remain a big topic in the world and will also impact us on the food and agri side going forward quite a bit. So right now we take it as a real win, but think in terms of China also, they have given it to us, not only because they wanted to pay us a favor, for sure not. They've done it because first of all, they needed volumes. They need barley in the country. And you look at the market where right now Canada is getting very dry and it's looking almost a little bit like it did two years ago when they had the real drought there. It's not as bad yet, but as one of the biggest exporters of barley, Canada has an issue. You, we need to talk about Ukraine, which is another big exporter in, in Russia. So from that angle, we do want to talk about that in a second. And you need to also think about the European Union had rains during harvest, which uh, means the quality is not the greatest either. So China probably also thought, well, let's give it to Australia. We benefit from it as well. So that's all good news. But if we're thinking a little bit further, Right now, we also see the prices of barley taking off here in the country. So it really helps us, especially on the malting barley side, to see those openings up. As mentioned, geopolitics will remain a theme. And it's not only about Russia. It's not only about uh, Ukraine. But also, clearly, we need to keep a very close eye on China and the relationships in the Asian areas there um, and how it may impact. And there's a lot of other countries. I don't expect any of you to understand all the flags on there because honestly, I don't remember them. But uh, there's a lot of conflict zones in the world and a lot of those countries either need food as an imported goods and uh, with that also uh, food trade is in many of those countries an important topic but can always face issues. So let's talk about Ukraine as a big one because I get a lot of questions and, and the people say to me, oh, look, it seems like prices have come down on the grain side quite a bit because well, it seems like finally we're producing enough to meet the global growth. And if you think about the world, um, if we can produce enough, can we get it from where it is produced to where it is needed? Ukraine has done a fantastic job exporting. If you think about the last 12 months, so the last marketing that they finished, in a full year of war, they have exported as much grains and oil seeds as they have done in any of the five years before. Fantastic achievement. Nobody would have ever thought they can pull it off and they've done it. They've gotten really creative as well because before the war started, they were pretty much like Australia. Get it inland to the next port, put it on a boat and get it out of the country because that is the cheapest way of shipping grain to the world market. Now, they are clearly having borders across the world and, and to the European Union and to other countries. So what we see these days since middle of July, Mr. Putin does not allow vessels to leave the Ukraine. And with that, we basically have seen that the preferred route is actually you go to that very far southwestern tip of Ukraine, put it on a barge over there, go on a side canal of the Danube and go to Constanza. But Constanza can only handle about 20% of the grain exports of Ukraine. The rest needs to find another way to the world. And clearly the European Union here has said, we're going to help you. But going up to northern Germany, northern Poland, that adds roughly a thousand kilometers. So adding one more from Albany up to, uh, to Geraldton, probably in terms of inland transport that you have to pay for. It's freaking expensive. If your logistics are expensive, you want to ship something that is really, really valuable. So what is more valuable than corn? Well, oil seeds are. They really love their oil seeds these days in the Ukraine. We see for the next planting season, and they're already in the process of planting rapeseed, that they're going to plant more rapeseed because that is a valuable crop for them, and they try and get it all over to Europe. So we think that even without the grain deal signed, Ukraine has gotten very creative and will probably make it happen to get most of the grain out of the country. They will compete with us as an exporter in the world market, and so will Russia. Russia has once again a big crop, they have inventories, they're going hard, they can get paid, they can find vessels, 
they're going to compete with us through the next 12 months very, very hard in the export channel. And um, from that angle, they will make the price also on the global market these days. So we're going to need usually every year 45 million tons more grains to feed the rising population, to feed the li rising livestock sector. And we're going to get probably very close to that. Last night, the US government released their latest uh, estimate. And the first one in September is always based on some more fundamentals. So looking at fields, taking some actual data into the account. The corn yield went down, but the acreage went up. So net-net, the crop is pretty much unchanged in the, U in the US. And that is the big one. So if you look at that orange piece, that helps the world to get what it needs. And that's what's setting some pressure on our global prices these days, because there is no disaster in the US coming. So the one to watch is probably Canada. But as mentioned, the market is expecting that crop to drop. But they're producing what we're producing. They're big in wheat, they're big in barley, and they're big in canola. And when they have an issue, it's usually beneficial for our prices. So let's watch them. But if you look at the rest of the world, there are a couple of other patchy places as well. Argentina, once again, not in good shape. We have the export logistics around um, uh, the Ukraine, as mentioned. But overall, there's quite a bit of green on the map as well. So looking into the next 12 months, I think we're going to have enough grains, despite nothing being perfect in the world. There are a lot of areas that are not performing anywhere close to 100% of normal production volumes and still our prices have come down from those very high levels we had last year. So imagine a world where next year it rains in the United States and an El Nino not only means risk for us in Australia, especially on the East Coast of being dry, but it means for us there is a risk it's going to get wet in the mist west. And you remember what happens when it got wet in Australia, we had good yields. You may not want to have the best and biggest, well not the best, but the biggest grain producer in the world to actually have a lot of rain. So let's see how it plays out in 12 months from now, um, if that has a big impact. Thinking about interest rates, thinking about land values. Well, our interest rates have gone up very quickly. We think we have one more rate hike to come. So we're going to sit by the end of the year, probably close to 4.35% cash rate in Australia. We don't expect the cash rate to drop very quickly. So even by the end of next year, we think we're going to still hover around close to 4% with the official cash rate. So money doesn't get much more expensive. That's good news. But it doesn't get free anymore like it was a few years ago. Um, that's maybe not that great news for us. Thinking about recession proof, um, if you think about studies that tell you, oh, we are heading into a global recession, well, maybe we don't even. But we at least have severe economic headwinds around the world. And what does that mean? It usually means if you think from a consumer perspective, you want to get your value out of it with less money spent. So how do you do that? Well, you go in and you say, oh, I'm maybe not eating a expensive beef steak. I'm not eating expensive lamb, and I know lamb is cheap these days. But at the end of the day, you're substituting with something that is even cheaper. So you try and find chicken or whatever on the plate. You may not eat all the time in the restaurant. You may eat at home, but that only works if you or your partner can cook. Otherwise, there's not a lot of value coming out of that one. But basically, what we see is the meat sector usually has an issue. So a lot of the studies suggest people try to save money on the meat side. They try to find the cheaper legumes and eggs and so on as a protein. And clearly, eggs are not cheap right now. But that is from the global financial crisis. So agri-sector overall feels the impact on the pricing side. But volume-wise, showing you here in blue in the background the aquaculture side of things growing, showing you the, the green line that's chicken consumption globally, showing you beef as a red line flat, the dark line is, is hog. And when you see around that frame there, 2008-ish, 9-ish, that was the global financial crisis. There is no dent in the road. So we don't have a volume reduction. Consumers just make it happen through price changes. And that's what we've gone through in the meat sector already, with prices also coming down quite a bit and on the livestock side. So the good news is probably the recession will not mean a whole lot of volume destruction, but prices are suffering from the economic crisis. If you're thinking about expensive Money, and that's one of the three factors we're usually watching when we're looking at land values. We think, how much do we produce on farm? How much do we have to pay for the interest rates? And we have to think about what kind of price do we get for the commodities. Right now, in the last few years, there's a lot of green on here because money was cheap, yields were good, prices were actually also pretty good. So we have seen land prices, and you see that blue line rising 30% on average across Australia in 2021, another 30% in 2022, and also early 23 has gone very strong. So we also feel that going forward, we're going to see that slowing down. 
but we are not expecting a destruction in land values. What we actually think the bigger risk is you get a lumpy disease, a skin disease in here, you get a, a foot and mouth disease in here, and we're really losing for a longer period of time our export market. That would hurt, in our view, maybe down the road, the land market. Maybe multiple droughts. I don't even think one year of drought would kill that land market. But clearly, I think the higher interest rates is not what we are too concerned about. There are other things that might hurt us. But for now, land, in our view, will continue to rise, even in the times when it's getting a little bit tougher with the margins on some of the farms and with the times when money is a little bit more expensive. But it won't grow at double digits in the years to come. We think in 24 and 25, we're going to go back to the lower single digits. But in Australia, and especially in WA, the demand is still there and outpaces most of the time the supply. Let's look at some structural changes. And uh, well, the really big one to think about is China. We're shipping so much stuff over there. Did you know that they have already peaked with their population? By the end of the century, they might only be half the amount of people that they are claiming to be right now. Half the amount of people means half of the amount of, um, of, uh, of mouths to feed. And by the way, they're getting old. A person my age eats about two and a half thousand calories. A person that is 20 years older eats about 10, 15% less calories. So they're getting less people and older. That's not good news for us who want to ship over there. We need to also think about China in their overall attempt to secure food security and make sure they're going to feed the mouse they have around the world. But they also will try and, and see that some of the new technologies, so growing lab meat, using fermentation to produce meat, um, replacing some of the ways of farming on soils and with livestock in a way that is substituting it. It's tiny right now, but China has time and they are working very hard on, on that. So once again, if they are able to produce meat without soybeans, without corn, the world will have a problem. We're going to have a problem. No matter if we're producing corn or soybeans here, the Brazilians will have a problem. The Brazilians will say, well, let's plant wheat, let's plant barley, let's plant something else. We don't care if nobody wants our soybeans. So that is one to watch on the round turn as well, how successful they will be. And the last one is biofuels. I know that it's a diverse and, and maybe a theme that not a lot of people sometimes appreciate, but we have two really big structural changes coming for our canola. Number one, sustainable air fuels. Number two, the, the, the renewable diesel in the, European U, in, in the US. So basically California has said, I want to lower the emissions in the transport sector and I will do that by just letting the industry decide how to do it. So Mr. Elon Musk and his Teslas might do the job. Maybe Toyota and the nitrogen, hydrogen cars will do the job. And the big technology that is out there right now that's rising very big is called renewable diesel. So you're taking a vegetable oil, a used cooking oil, some animal fats, and you convert one liter of those fats into one liter of uh, biodiesel or renewable diesel. And the industry is growing quickly. Look at that orange bar. We're basically adding the same amount of capacity in five years in the US as the US, uh, the European overall biodiesel industry is big. So a massive amount. It changes the way that canola is demanded over there because they need veg oils, they need used cooking oils. The other one to think about is sustainable air fuels. Think about all these airlines in the world. I mean, I stepped yesterday on a plane to uh, Albany and up here again, and that Rex plane was probably close to my age. Um, and I, I don't want to be bad about Rex because the Qantas plane I was on coming over here didn't look much younger either. So um, think about it this way. If tomorrow there was a perfect electric plane available, the perfect hydrogen plane, whatever, and it isn't, it's going to take them at least 10 years to figure it out. But if it was, it's going to still take decades to replace the world's fleet. So what does an airline industry which wants to reduce emissions have to do? Well, you want to put something in the tank that helps you lower your emissions so you can still run your old planes. And that's what sustainable air fuels is all about. The announced capacity is once again very, very big. For now, we already have announcements out there that are bigger than the European biodiesel industry. So it's a lot. And if you look at the pie chart, most of that announced technology is using animal fats, used cooking oil, vegetable oil, so some kind of a fatty substance to make it happen. There's a little bit 10% using ethanol, be it from sugar, be it from grains, but a lot will come once again to vegetable oil. 
Vegetable oil for me is a really big one. And the question is, can we benefit from that? Because we have canola over here. I think canola will remain a very good crop because people need veg oils. Yes, they all want to use cooking oil, but easy one is already collected. Going to McDonald's and Burger King saying, can I have your used cooking oil? That's already done. The hard part is now to go to all these households and say, can you give me a jar of your old veg oil? And you said, yeah, I put it on the train. Sorry, mate. Um, so with that, I think we're going to see veg oil in very strong demand. And even here in Australia, if you think at the, the map over here, um, first of all, what I circled up there, you don't see Australia on there. So it's tiny for now. But could we have an industry as well over here? Well, if you think about the amounts of airplanes taking off, we don't need to hide behind uh, Paris, Charles de Gaulle Airport, or behind London Heathrow Airport. Our airports in Melbourne and in Sydney are pretty much the same size. If you're thinking about Perth or if you're thinking about Adelaide, our airports and the amount of airplanes they're leaving there is, well, who can guess what that one is? And I asked the Rabo guys to be quiet because I've seen it. That's half the Trump Tower. So basically, the two cities together are as big as Chicago or here. There's a lot of planes leaving. We have the scale to probably make it happen. The question is rather, does it make sense? And where do you put your crushing industry to produce the sustainable air fuels? Because clearly we have a very variable crop. We have some years where we produce two and a half million tons and we have years where we have eight and a half million tons of canola. And it is just sometimes easier to get that canola from wherever it is into the nearest port rather than say, oh, you need to go somewhere to a centralized facility to process. But there's a lot of demand coming probably for veg oils. And you've seen also some investments here in our Australian crushing footprint, which is largely on the East Coast these days. So with that, I'm excited about veg oils. Um, Last thing from us, there's a lot of free research out there from Rabobank. We do a monthly. You can all get that. You don't need to be a client. You can listen to our podcast. It's free. You don't have to listen to my voice. We have some more pleasant speaking persons on the podcast as well. But uh, all to say, we're here to support the industry. We want you guys to work with us and to, to transform the industry to be better. I think I'm excited about Australia. I mean, I came down here and I think you guys are really good farmers and we need to somehow rock this industry and benefit from the trends that are coming. So uh, with that, we're sharing a lot of knowledge and we want to help the industry. So uh, I hope you're going to make that transition happen and uh, I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you.